Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second 3P seminar uh, session that is brought to you uh, thanks to a collaboration between the Cure Parkinson's Trust, the World Parkinson Coalition, and the Van Andel Institute. My name is Lisa Burquist, and I'm a postdoc researching Parkinson's disease at the Van Andel Institute, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And today we're going to have a very interesting session talking about uh, truncation of alpha synuclein in the appendix and also GBA. <coughs> uh, treatment of GBA associated PD. And I'm going to let my co-chair, Mickey, introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Mickey. I'm a postdoc in Patrick Brunden's lab at the Van Andel Institute. I'm coming to you from Australia and where I'm currently self-isolating, day 12 or 14, so almost there. Um, my internet connection isn't the best, so if I end up I might need to cancel my video later when I'm chairing a session. So apologies for that ahead of time. Back to you, Lisa. So the outline for today's session is that we have two different presenters who are going to have two different uh, presentations. We're going to start with Brian Killinger, who's a postdoc at Rush Medical Center. And he's going to talk about truncation of alpha synuclein in the human appendix of synucleinopathy patients. And after his presentations, we're, we're going to have move on to the Q&A portion of Brian's talk. And so at the bottom of your screen, you can uh, go ahead and start submitting questions as soon as they pop into your head. And after that, we're gonna, I'm going to hand it over to Mickey, who's going to introduce our next speaker, Konstantin Senkevich, and his uh, topic. And we're going to have a Q&A for that presentation at the end as well. So I'm just going to hand it over to Brian now and let him start. Okay. Thank you. you see my screen? All right. Hello, my name is Brian Killinger. And as I said, I am a postdoc at Rush University. Um, I work in the laboratory of Jeff Cordover. And um, before I went to Rush, I was at the Van Andel Institute and working on a project um, mostly centered around the role of the human appendix in Parkinson's disease. And so I'm going to talk mostly about that project today, um, specifically some work we're doing with mass spec to look at different forms of alpha synuclein in the appendix. Um, and that is my main interest is uh, alpha synuclein. It's biology and how it's involved with the initiation of disease. So one question is why study the appendix in Parkinson's disease or synucleopathy? Um, and for the, the main reason is we look at um, epidemiological uh, data and um, analyze, uh, I believe it was 1.6 million patient data sets or data points and it was from the Swedish registry and the PPMI data set and what we found was that appendectomy um, especially when it occurred years before any symptoms of Parkinson's disease was associated with a delayed onset of the disease um, suggesting that, that in fact uh, appendectomy had some protective effect and that it was contributing to disease in a deleterious way. Um, so initially this was um, mysterious as to why the appendix would be involved with disease and why it would be involved with the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And I went searching for a mechanism in the appendix and trying to figure out why it was playing this role. And one of the things we noticed was that in the human appendix, there was quite a bit of um, proteinase K resistant alpha synuclein, so um, aggregated alpha synuclein, which looks a lot like what you see <clears throat> in the Parkinson's disease brain. So we have this pathology like alpha synuclein um, abundant throughout the human appendix. And um, 
this sort of gave us the idea that perhaps the appendix was a reservoir for disease associated proteoforms. And so we also noticed that in the appendix, when we isolated alpha synuclein or immunopurified it from the tissue, that there was quite a bit of truncated alpha synuclein um, in the appendix. And truncated alpha synuclein um, historically has been associated with Lewy bodies and Lewy pathology, specifically C term truncation. So we thought overall we had this aggregated form of synuclein and an abundant truncated proteoform, and that the uh, appendix could be a reservoir for these disease associated forms of alpha synuclein. Um, another observation that we made that sort of hinted at this idea, this direct mechanism that the appendix contained disease associated proteoforms, was we did an uh, aggregation assay where we took appendix lysate and we um, spiked that into a uh, mixture of recombinant alpha synuclein. And the idea was to sort of see aggregation and see if there were any prion type alpha synucleins uh, or forms of alpha synuclein in the sample. And what I observed was not necessarily a seeding effect, but we, were, we observed rapid uh, cleavage or truncation, the shortening of, of alpha synuclein once we spiked, uh, spiked the alpha synuclein. And as alpha synuclein was truncated, it also aggregated concurrently. So we thought, well, there's this truncation occurring, there's aggregation occurring at the same time. And so maybe the truncation and aggregation is something that is very abundant in the appendix or is what's distinguished the appendix and makes it disease relevant. And so our hypothesis was basically that this process of cleavage, uh, proteolytic cleavage in the appendix um, and the accumulation of these cleavage products could um, basically increase the burden of disease associated proteoforms in the, in the body. And then these peripheral proteoforms could then subsequently spread to the central nervous system and cause Parkinson's disease or promote the formation of pathology that's associated with Parkinson's disease. And so truncation really has been looked, uh, truncation of alpha synuclein has been looked at for a long time as a factor in um, disease pathology. Um, so there's two basic ways truncation can play a role in pathology. Um, there's maturation, so one solute pathology in the aggregates form. You can have truncation of the C and N terminus, which then can affect the uh, formation and further maturation of, of Lewy pathology that is then toxic. Um, but what we're going to focus on here is the initiation of pathology and the role of truncation in that initiation. So just as kind of a primary alpha synuclein in the cell, it exists in basically two flavors or three flavors, depending on its disease cells. So you have most of synuclein, the grand majority of synuclein content in the cell is intrinsically disordered. So it sort of has no structure and is soluble. And then you have um, some fraction of alpha synuclein that acquires an alpha helix in the N terminus, particularly when interacting with lipid membranes. And then there's the third flavor, which is the disease associated alpha synuclein, which is basically uh, beta sheet rigid fibril structures um, that are stacking the not domain of each individual alpha synuclein molecule. And we think that the cleavage or the cutting of alpha synuclein, either inappropriately or the timing of the cleavage, is then leading, leading to this aggregation. Um, and just as a, as a background, there's been much work done that showed that uh, various cleavages and uh, truncation products at the C terminus of alpha synuclein increase or enhance the kinetics of aggregation of alpha synuclein, at least in vitro, and also affect the 
pre on properties of the resulting FIB rules. So our strategy at first to understand truncation in the appendix in this rule of disease is to really just kind of take a survey and identify as many proteoforms of alpha synuclein that we can. And to do this, we took tissues, uh, appendix tissue, and substantial nigra tissue from both controls and patients with uh, Parkinson's disease or, or Lewy body dementia. And we then immunopurified alpha synuclein from these samples and then analyzed all the alpha synuclein proteoforms in that sample by a method called top down mass spectrometry. And so this varies from normal mass spec in that there is no enzymatic, um, you do not treat the samples with enzyme before you analyze. And the benefit of this is that you can actually measure intact proteoforms, so the whole protein and you can tell specific cleavage sites and very specifically which proteoforms are in the sample. So it's a very powerful technique if you're looking for truncation or cleavage products in your sample. And doing this so far, what we found is there's a huge diversity of proteoforms in the appendix and the brain. Um, we've identified 99 proteoforms to date and uh, it's actually closer to, I believe, 66 proteoforms if you don't count uh, methionine and oxidation products. So with all these proteoforms, there's a huge diversity that we're seeing that we didn't know um, existed before. And we do see um, quite a, a few more proteoforms or um, diversity of proteoforms in the appendix than we do in the substantia digra. And so the pro Proteoforms we identified in the appendix in the brain do appear to coincide somewhat. Um, in other words, the proteoforms that are abundant in the appendix are also abundant in the brain. So there's some method of the madness, and this is probably part of the normal life cycle of alpha synuclein in these, many of these truncation products. And um, But we're looking for really disease-specific proteoforms um, as an overall goal. Um, and we think we found some. So here is some of the analysis, the initial analysis we did with our data set, um, looking at proteoforms in both the appendix and substantial nigra and in control of disease tissue. And just as a rough analysis, we can see there are proteoforms that we find unique to disease, um, but also proteoforms that are differentially regulated between the tissues. So this is very interesting because that's suggesting that the appendix indeed does have um, a different pathway or mechanism of alpha synuclein cleavage. And this might be our key to why it's associated with disease. And so we actually found three proteoforms listed down here that were unique to appendix tissue and were not found in any of the brain samples. And that's, that's very exciting to me because that tells us that indeed there are several proteoforms that are occurring peripherally that are not occurring in the brain. And so just as summary for what we, we looked at and how this, how this works towards our goal. So we found, we well, so far found 66 distinct alpha synuclein proteoforms with 24 distinct cleavage sites. Um, there are three unique proteoforms of the appendix. Um, we, I, I think that this is sort of a detailed look at alpha synuclein turnover in these tissues, which is wholly unique. We can kind of start to understand how this protein is processed um, in human tissue. And down here, I show two renderings of both the fibril structure and a uh, crooked alpha, alpha helix uh, structure of alpha synuclein. And what I, what I did here was I, this red section is the primary spot where we're seeing cleavage. And you can see basically the cleavage is occurring on these outer portions of the fibril structure. So everything is keeping that 
not domain intact in the central core of fibril intact. So in other words, a lot of these proteoforms are fibril competent and could be related to disease. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody who's worked on this project. It's been um, it's ongoing and it's been a lot of people at Van Andel. Um, Jeff, we've written a grant to hopefully continue this work in my current lab. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, comments, concerns. Thank you, Brian, for that very interesting presentation. So now we're moving into the Q&A portion of Brian's talk. Does, can you hear me, Brian? Yeah, now it's working. Ah, excellent, excellent. Well, we make it work. <laughs> That's how you do it when you're, everything's going live. So let's just jump into some of the questions. So we have one here from Amir. He's kind of asking a, what came first, the hen or the egg question. So many studies suggest that aggregates undergo proteolytic digestion, which would propose that truncation is secondary uh, following aggregation. Is there any evidence that support that truncation occurs prior to aggregation as a causative? So the most convincing evidence would be the work done with C-terminal truncations um, that show at least up until the point, till about um, amino acid 120 of synuclein, if you truncate that, you can enhance the aggregation kinetics so the protein will aggregate more rapidly. Um, I say to a point because if you start to cut off too much of the protein and get towards the knock domain, you actually abolish aggregation. Um, so there seems to be a sweet spot that you might enhance the aggregation kinetics. And so our thinking is that if that were to occur um, and you would have either too much truncation or inappropriate truncation at the wrong site, you might have truncation products that are going to aggregate very rapidly and overwhelm the cell. Okay. So do you see most of these truncation, truncated ver versions of alpha nuclein uh, as part of aggregates or are they soluble? So, yeah, what we did in this study is actually different than what's been done in the past. Um, in the past, people have looked at both the soluble fraction of synuclein, which is going to be basically um, the non-disease synuclein, and then they looked at insoluble synuclein, so synuclein that's already been uh, trafficked or is sequestered to inclusion. So we're looking at that soluble fraction, so this should be sort of normal synuclein, so we're trying to figure out if the pattern of truncation um, can be associated with pathology and with disease. Um, like I said, we're sort of uh, conceptually on the other end um, with this data set. So we actually don't know which proteoforms directly might be involved with the pathology or the pathology like synuclein in the appendix. So we're sort of looking upstream of that, really because my interest is in what's initiating the process and not necessarily the proteoforms that are sequestered to the Lewy pathology. Okay, so do you think that the truncated alpha synuclein forms are uh, less likely to be degraded? Um, so not, not exactly. I mean, most of these truncated proteoforms are probably a result of normal turnover and normal degradation within the cell. So uh, conceivably, if the protein were truncated um, inappropriately, I would, I would more think that it would affect downstream functions such as uh, lipid binding or again, exposing that knock domain so that the protein will aggregate more quickly. But I don't, I don't think we have any direct evidence to show that a specific truncated proteoform would um, sort of stop the process of removing alpha synuclein from the cell. Okay, so uh, you're talking about truncated alpha synuclein in the appendix. Have you guys, or do you know of any other studies that have looked at truncated alpha synuclein in the substantia nigra of patients uh, or yeah. in mouse models? 
Yeah, so there was, um, I mean, the other study that has basically took the approach that we are taking um, with the exception that they looked at the insoluble pathological silicon. Um, there was a paper, I think it's in 2016, and they did the same sort of approach we're doing. It described many of the proteoforms that we're seeing here. The only exception is we do seem to see more proteoform uh, variety within both tissues. And I think that's just a function of we are looking at quite a few uh, tissue samples from many different individuals in this case. So I think we're just looking a little deeper into what are the rare or um, less abundant proteoforms. If you remember the graph um, where I ranked all the proteoforms by their abundance within samples overall, um, there's a large portion of these proteoforms that are quite rare and only found at low abundance, maybe at a few samples. And so how those relate to disease is it's difficult to study, but it's interesting to know that they do exist and they can be detected in these tissues. So, um, but as far as function of these truncated proteoforms, um, I would look to the animal studies that have been done that have injected fibrils of truncated proteoforms, various truncated proteoforms, and also uh, the in vitro work I was talking about, just studying the kinetics of aggregation with these truncated proteoforms. Okay. So maybe one last question now before we move, I leave it to Mickey to wrap it up. So Galina asks, where do the truncated parts go? If uh, amino acid 1 to 114, is found where is 50, 115 to 140? Should the ratio be one to one? And how selective, uh, how's the selectivity of the clearance performed? Yeah, so there's a caveat um, to what we're measuring here. So, all samples we conducted an immunopurification based on an antibody, which the epitope maps to uh, roughly within the NAC domain. So that said, we can only, by definition, we can only detect um, proteoforms that contain that region. So um, that sort of limits somewhat what we can see in the sample. And as far as the remaining, you know, um, smaller peptides that uh, are removed from synuclein, again, we're not going to detect those because um, it's outside of our epitope. So we're really gonna see the, the remaining truncated form that's, that's close to that NAC domain. Thank you so much, Brian, for answering these questions. And thank you for sticking it out, everybody who's listening with, to us, uh, trying to figure out all of these technical issues. On to you, Mickey, now. Thank you, guys. Hi. Um, hopefully we can work out how to cancel Brian's screen sharing while I now introduce our next speaker. We have Konstantin Semkovich, a postdoc at McGill University in Canada. So he will be presenting today on approaches to treat, uh, to the treatment of GBA associated Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Good, let me hide it. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for this nice opportunity to shave and dress official shirt and present uh, my talk to you. Uh, really thank you for these difficult times entertaining us with uh, seminars, which is amazing. So without further ado, let me start uh, to present uh, about approaches to the treatment of GBA-associated Parkinson's disease. I will cover more background. Um, and we will talk about some research as well. So uh, we know that genetics play an important role in Parkinson's disease and there is uh, monogenic forms, uh, variants in these genes are very rare but they increase risk of Parkinson's disease in many forms. There is also low risk variants, they are quite common but they increase risk of Parkinson's disease just a little bit. There is also high risk variants, they are relatively common in the population and they increase risk of Parkinson's disease in quite a few forms. 
and uh, this variance includes variance in uh, GBA gene and one particular variant in LRK2, which is G2019S. The cross section between Parkinson disease and Gachet disease uh, was known for quite a while now. First publication occurred in 1939, that we at least know. And uh, many researchers later on showed that patients with uh, Gachet disease, as well as um, as well as uh, uh, patients, uh, relatives of patients with Gaucher disease uh, develop uh, uh, different extrapyramidal or Parkinsonian symptoms. Later on, a uh, um, big study was uh, conducted, uh, built multicenter studies that showed that the risk of uh, development of Parkinson's disease uh, in carriers of GBA increased six to eight times. Uh, although it depends on the um, uh, population. What happens in uh, Gaucher disease? Uh, GBA encodes uh, enzyme, glucoserbazidase, it's a lysosomal enzyme. And due to mutations in GBA, this enzyme activity reduced. And uh, due to the reduction of activity, it's not able to break down substrates. Because in, case, in this case, it's uh, glucoserbazidase. And this substrate is accumulating, and also lisa form of this substrate is accumulating because it's single line. It's interesting that in Gaucher disease, we can treat uh, Gaucher disease by enzyme replacement therapy or by substrate reduction. So, by enzyme replacement therapy, we just inject a recombinant enzyme to the patient, and by uh, substrate reduction therapy, we block synthesis of uh, glucosyl serobrazide by blocking glucosyl ceramide synthase. Unfortunately, this treatment is not available for um, Parkinson's disease patients since uh, recombinant decays is not crossing the blood brain barrier and uh, no treatment for uh, Gaucher disease substrate reduction therapy, Meglustat, was not effective in the neuropathic form of uh, Gaucher disease. There is a number of theories in um, Parkinson's disease, in GBA-associated Parkinson's disease, although how it's occurred. So one of the theories is that changes in lysosomal membrane properties could cause um, uh, development of GBA-PD. Other theory is uh, that in neuroinflammation play a role in uh, GBA-associated Parkinson's disease. There are some studies that show uh, elevated cytokine uh, level in blood of patients with uh, GBA-PD. Also, it's possible uh, that uh, metaphagy play a role in GBAPD and uh, that it is that GBA retained in, uh, in the plasmid reticulum in, at some extent. Also, it's possible that all these um, theories are true in some extent. Most um, reliable and most uh, proved theory is a positive feedback loop between GBA and alpha synuclein. That means that. Uh, uh, due to reduction of activity of decays, uh, there is uh, elevation of alpha synuclein. It could be uh, due to a few possible mechanisms by direct interaction between decays and alpha synuclein, also by direct interaction uh, of substrates, glucosyl cerebrazide and uh, glucosyl sphingosyl in this alpha synuclein. And uh, elevation of alpha synuclein causing aggregation or uh, causing reduction of activity decays. So I also have to mention that uh, patients with uh, GBA associated Parkinson's disease have less favorable course of disease compared to genetically undetermined Parkinson's disease patients. They have higher risk of development uh, of non motor symptoms, including anxiety, depression, cognitive impairment some autonomy dysfunction, and also earlier age at onset compared to patients uh, sporadic or genetically undetermined Parkinson's disease patients. What do we know about the chemistry uh, that's going on in patients with GBAPD? We know that uh, activity indeed reduced in carriers, in heterozygous carriers of GBA with uh, Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, surprisingly, we also know that uh, decays is reduced in activity, at least in some subpopulation of sporadic or genetically undetermined PD patients. We also know that uh, GK's activity reduced in the brains of 
cardiac Parkinson's disease patients. We also have some knowledge about substrate concentration um, in, uh, in blood of uh, Parkinson's disease patients with GBA variants. We know that uh, substrate is uh, a little bit increased in the blood of PD patients, uh, although not that significantly. And we, uh, we didn't see any substrate accumulation in the brains of GBA PD patients. So maybe the residual activity of GKs is enough to break down glucosyl cerebrazide for it's not to accumulate in the brains of GBA PD patients. What could we do? We can apply a uh, few strategies. We can, um, with gene therapy and molecular chaperones, we can uh, increase activity of GKs, and also we can uh, block glucosylceramide uh, synthase with a substrate reduction therapy. Few words how it can be done. It's just an example of how chaperone works. So, um, Chaperone uh, GBM uh, mut mutations may interrupt post translation folding and prevent transportation of uh, enzyme to the lysosome, as you can see here. So, um, chaperones bind to the enzyme and facilitating transportation to the lysosome, and acidic uh, lysosome elude uh, it from chaperone, restoring normal catalysis and uh, lysosomal function. There is few clinical trials now ongoing, and first uh, clinical trials have been published. The results of clinical trials have been published recently. It's trial of the well-known drug Ambraxol. This drug uh, was used as a cough medicine uh, to resolve mucus. And this open-label clinical trial of 17 patients with Parkinson's disease, with GBA and without GBA variant, without controls and without placebo. So they actually met endpoints that they stated. Ambraxol crossed blood-brain barrier with target binding. Uh, they showed that it's increased uh, uh, GBA protein levels and cerebral fluid uh, alpha-synuclein levels. Also, they show some peculiar uh, findings that it decreased GKS activity, which uh, they explained that it's uh, decreased due to the increase of activity inside of cells and decrease in CSF. There is few uh, other uh, clinical trials now ongoing. One is the uh, Ambroxol uh, in uh, Parkinson's disease dementia. It's uh, second phase now, so hopefully we will see some results soon. And then our other drug is currently ongoing. It's LTI-291. Um, it's activated of GKs, so it's not uh, actually a molecular chaperone. It activates the activity of residual GKs, but also have some chaperone properties. What do we know about substrate reduction therapy clinical trials? We know that there is a drug called Gangrostat is now in clinical trials, big multicentral clinical trial. Uh, it came out of um, studies that um, uh, reduction of glucosyl ceramide could uh, increase behavior and cognitive uh, function in mice. It could be measured and applied for humans. There was some uh, critic about this study, but hopefully we will see, of course, positive effect of this study. So uh, we can also find new targets, and new targets could be uh, GBA modifiers. My colleague, Lynn Kron, was leading um, paper in Annals of Neuro that was published in Annals of Neurology. Uh, she will talk, uh, I think, next week. So uh, in this study, uh, they show that uh, variant in TMEM-175, and TMEM-175 is important um, channel, Kali, uh, important channel in lysosome, and variant in this um, gene was associated with a three year earlier age of onset in GBA associated Parkinson's disease. And also, this variant was associated with a decrease of GKS activity. So, it's quite interesting and um, promising modifier. And think about this gene, we will, we will hear more on Thursday on the session of the, about uh, membranes of lysosome. 
Also, there is one more promising target. It's uh, gene encodes catepsin B. It's shown to significantly affect penetrance of uh, GBA-associated Parkinson's disease. Uh, also, we know that there is some interaction between uh, GKs and LRK2. Patients uh, with GBA-associated Parkinson's disease, as I said, have more severe phenotype. On the contrary, carriers of LRK2 variants resemble mild, milder phenotype. So uh, it's been shown that carriers of mutation in both genes LRK2 and GBA have milder phenotype compared to patients with only GBA-associated Parkinson's disease. So it's been speculated that LRK could uh, have some protective uh, effect on GBA. Recently, Yassel Stein and colleagues showed red reduced activity of GKs in dopaminergic neurons derived from patients with LRK2 variants. Moreover, in the same study, they showed the correction of uh, LRK2 variants in dopaminergic neurons resulted in the normalization of GKs activity. So here we see uh, two contradictions. From a clinical standpoint, uh, LRK is protective for GBA, and from other standpoint, in a dopamine allergic neurons, it works other way. Uh, depending on how it works, we can uh, project it to clinical trials for LRK, because uh, there is now drug that decreases activity of LRK2 uh, kinase, the decreased activity of this kinase, and if uh, it's as it showed in uh, dopamine allergic neurons, we can use it in a patient with a GBAPD to decrease activity of the GBAPD. But if it's not, it's not the case. So we decided to study the interaction between uh, LRK2 in, and uh, its effect on the activity. We had sequencing of uh, LRK2 and GBA variants and um, measurement of GK's activity and this linear regression models. This study the interaction. So we found uh, some variants that affect activity significantly. All these variants uh, positively affect activity. So all these variants increase activity of GKs. Surprisingly, uh, we found that protective haplotype variants from protective haplotype substantially but still significantly increase activity of GKs. Moreover, we uh, confirm results that was shown earlier in a paper in Brain that I showed you, that G2019S uh, increased activity of GKs, and this is a deleterious variant. Also, a variant that is not associated with Parkinson's disease, and it's not protective. In our cohort, M1646T is uh, really significantly associated with the increased activity of GKs. So um, this variant is a bit um, surprising because it's not associated with PD in our cohort. It was associated with Parkinson's disease in other cohorts, in some cohorts. So it would be really interesting to do functional study on the protective haplotype and this variant specifically. It is uh, also interesting to mention uh, that protective haplotype is work on the same pattern as a deleterious variant in G2019S. So it's increased activity. Uh, we separated PD and controls, and we showed that uh, in a protective haplotype, increased activity in a controls more significantly, more higher, which is as it should be. So uh, we can speculate on a few questions here that, uh, as was shown by Yeselstein and colleagues, that it's not direct interaction and probably other proteins or other enzymes play a role in uh, the interaction in between. They showed that RAP10 is uh, playing an important role in the modification of GK's activity. That it could be the case. It also could be the case that uh, it's different in the central nervous system and the periphery and we can see uh, different results in uh, CSF, for example. Uh, we need to study it further. Hopefully, after a shutdown is over, we will be able to do some functional studies. Uh, of course, there is uh, other genes in the lysosomal pathway, and my main project uh, that hopefully we will be able to conduct in the near future after shutdown is over is to study the role of all the different uh, lysosomal genes and uh, genes uh, involved in a GBA pathway uh, to the risk of uh, Parkinson's disease. 
it's a uh, funding of our lab uh, and thanks for people in my lab and uh, head of our lab did gunner if any questions i would be happy to answer Don't hear anybody. Okay. Yeah, I okay, hear you. Wanna Amazing. <laughs> stop sharing your screen now. I'm in the process. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that excellent presentation. We have quite a few questions coming through, so we'll get started. Um, one question asks: Do you think that mitophagy def uh, defects in the GB a Parkinson's disease have anything to do with the role of the lysosome in mitochondrial fission? Question again. Uh, two seconds. So uh, the question was I didn't hear the first few words. Sorry. That's okay. I'll turn my video off and see if that improves the audio. So the question was Do you think that mitophagy defects in GBA? associated Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. have anything to do with the role of lysosomes in mitochondrial fission? So uh, there was quite potent interaction between lysosomal function and uh, mitophagy. It's been shown that there is proteins that interact in between. Also LRK that is mainly affect mitophagy is also affecting uh, lysosomal function from uh, with, uh, for example, RAP10 protein, RAP8 protein. Uh, thus, it could be that uh, effect could be indirect through the uh, different interaction of the lysosomal uh, metaphagy genes on the lysosome and their way back. Also, it's possible that uh, due to the low function of lysosome, uh, it could affect metaphagy by the reducing uh, general uh, autosomal lysosomal function. Okay, thank you. Um, a more general question, somebody has asked, what is the proportion of PD patients carrying the GBA mutation? So uh, it's quite, it's relatively high. It's uh, depending on the population. For example, in Ashkenazi Jew, it's really high. It's up to 20%. In a general population, it's depending on the population, but it's from three to seven, eight percent. And of those, how many go on to actually develop Parkinson's disease? So uh, it's a tricky question. Uh, there was uh, only few studies that uh, study penetrans, and one study studied only uh, relatives of GBA uh, PT patients, which is uh, a bit uh, biased. They showed that penetrans is high, it's 30%, but other studies that uh, studied only GBA carriers. Uh, healthy GB carriers show that penetrance is low. It's only up to 9% in an age of 80. Interesting. Um, another question. Uh, so from Patrick Brunden, he said, last week we heard about the urogenital tract and MSA in where GBA might be a genetic risk factor. And today we heard about the appendix and Parkinson's disease. Do you know if GBA is expressed in the gut and the urinary bladder, or is it expressed in immune cells that patrol these tissues? I wouldn't lie about uh, urinary bladder, but it's surely expressed in gut. And I think GBA is expressed uh, more or less everywhere uh, because uh, finger lipids is everywhere, especially in neurons. And for sure it's expressed in immune cells. Uh, I'm not sure uh, in which extent, but it should really play a role, in, at least in gut. Uh, I wouldn't lay that I couldn't say uh, how it's related to the central tissue uh, compared to the periphery. So do you know if the role of GBA in immune cells is known or is it thought just to be involved with that lysosomal pathway? Actually, there is a few studies now, um, I think going to study the role of uh, GBA in astrocytes but uh, it's still not published. Uh, I think there is, uh, of course, a role in an in a immune system because it's, uh, it should be expressed 
everywhere where is a membrane because uh, glucose single lipids play important role in the membrane so it should be uh, expressed everywhere <laughs> I think you just <laughs> answered this question as well, that what cellular sources of GBA in the brain, is it in only neuronal cells or all cell types? So I'm guessing that's what you were just saying. It is expressed in the brain in all cells? Uh, at some extent, yes. Excellent. Um, Michael Henderson has asked um, where the GCAs or GKs activity measurements performed in the blood. So it's measured by a few ways. It's measured in dry blood spot mainly by mass spectrometry method. It's also measured in uh, blood in lake sites with uh, fluorocentered measures. It's been speculated if uh, mass spectrometry is more sensitive because it's not um, rely on the fluorescent marker, but yes, it's measured. And it's actually uh, the measurement of GKs in blood is uh, one of the biomarkers for Gaucher disease. So it's uh, actively performing procedure worldwide. Okay, so it's quite an established technique if it's used in Gaucher's disease? It is, yes. Uh, Karen Frank has asked, she has uh, GBA associated Parkinson's at 49 years. How soon do you think before treatments may be available? As you know, with clinical trials, it's really slow. Uh, there is some uh, promise for Ambroxol that is because it's finished second phase. But still, uh, it's difficult to have, give some hope because we haven't seen clinical effect and uh, so maybe have some modifying effect on clinical symptoms. It wouldn't be a uh, cure. So it could be uh, one of the, probably uh, all the patients still would need a uh, modification of different treatments, including new treatments that may occur in the near future. So along those lines, what do you think the most promising, targ promising target is to treat GBA-associated PD? So I think for GBA PD, the most promising is uh, for now, uh, as we saw in the experiments and in the clinical trials, it's indeed the chaperones, it's a drug that uh, activated and um, help to maintain its function in lysosome and transport it there. Uh, because it seems that it uh, works from the pathogenesis, although uh, it's uh, really difficult to um, see and prognose the clinical effect because if disease is already developed, some of the cells already uh, damaged. So we had to target prodromal Parkinson's PD patients and Parkinson's disease patients with early onset, like not early onset, with a, a subclinical uh, disease to find them uh, by identifying currently behavior disordered patients and patients with all the clinical markers that we can possibly uh, find and also identify uh, healthy carriers and try to predict if they could develop disease or not. Okay, we have a question here from Sarah. Is Gaucher's disease fatal and what makes the same mutation cause one disease or the other. So, what so causes I, yeah, it to that I, I, yeah, thank you. I didn't make it clear, I think, until. So, Gaucher disease is a disease that developed due to homozygous, that means that mutation in both alleles, or compound heterozygous uh, mutation in GBA. In Parkinson's disease, heterozygous mutation that decrease activity slightly, but not in the full extent, increase risk of Parkinson's disease. Also, patients with Gaucher disease have increased risk of Parkinson's disease in, at the same extent. It's not fatal. Uh, there is three types of uh, Gaucher disease. Uh, one of them is uh, the common type, and it's treatable by a uh, person just live normal life, and they receive uh, recombinant GKs or substrate reduction therapy for all their life, uh, and it's quite uh, good maintained. Yeah, so it's not fatal. There is some variants that lead to fatal uh, Gaucher disease, uh, neonatal death, and um, other variants can lead to neuropathic 
severe neuropathic form of Gaucher disease with the involvement of central nervous system and neurological uh, symptoms. And unfortunately, neurological symptoms is not treatable up to date. So there is also hope for Gaucher disease patients that for uh, these therapies that can cross blood-brain barrier that they can uh, be treatable. These neuropathic forms can be treated. Thank you. Um, one question from Carl. Any interaction between uh, SCARB2 and LIMP2 and GBA and GKs or any genetic one? Um, so yeah, it's indeed interaction uh, because LIMP2 is a transporter of GKs. It uh, helps to facilitate safe transport of GKs from uh, AR to lysosome. Although um, LIMP2 RNs have been associated with Parkinson's disease, but it was not associated with the uh, modification of GKs. Or maybe it's a rare variants that we can spot with the current uh, cohorts. So we need to increase cohort to see the more power. Um, so also, how specific do you think the link is between TMEM-175 and GBA? Would other lysosomal proteins not involved in Parkinson's disease also affect GKs? Uh, so uh, the link between TMEM and GBA, uh, ah, it's a question I haven't seen the second part. So the link between TMEM and GBA could be not um, direct, it could be due to the change of the lysosomal milieu, the acidity of lysosome, and also it could be the change of the membrane itself. Uh, but uh, the effect is quite important. Uh, TMEM is play, playing an important role in lysosome itself. So it affect all the, it should affect uh, all the lysosomal properties. And second part of the question, sorry, I missed it. Um, Let me see. Now sorry, now I need to find the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was if there was any other uh, lysosomal pathways uh, or markers so, that aren't involved with Parkinson's disease. That could yeah, affect yes. Uh, so we're going to study it. Hopefully we will find something. Um, for now, uh, I showed you all the significant modifiers that affect GK's activity uh, that we know. Uh, but it's, uh, as it was shown in the um, paper by, by uh, Lin, that uh, current um, variants explain only 20, around 25% of uh, change in activity of GK's. We still don't know uh, why it's changing in some uh, patients, uh, and we don't see any GB variants or any other variants. So hopefully we will be able to establish it in the next few years. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll start wrapping up this session. We have another question here first though. So from Joy Milne, if you're using mouse models, how would prodromal discovery enhance your research? Uh, we don't use mouse models and also by our <laughs> lead of the lab, it's not favorable to use mice models because they don't resemble uh, humans. Uh, with our collaborators, we use uh, dopaminergic neurons and uh, hope we will use 3D, 3D midbrain organoids, which is uh, which would be resemble more a uh, human being, but still not at full extent, are from full extent. Okay. Um, so we'll do one final question from Taran. What is the effect of physiological molecular chaperones towards GBA activity, e.g. heat shock proteins, etc.? cetera? What is the physiological molecular? Uh, so physiology, okay. So there is a few known studies that uh, hedgehog protein uh, 78 or 90 um, a, and um, granulin uh, combined uh, playing the role into the transport of GKs inside of lysosome. Uh, it hasn't been studied, uh, but there is one drug it's called arimoclamol. It, um, it 
actually increased activity of uh, hedgehog proteins. And it's been shown that uh, this drug can be used, if I'm not mistaken, in a Neumann peak type C. And also it's been studied uh, in the use of Gachet disease. And this drug works through the chaperones by, act by activating a transport decays. Hopefully I'm not mistaken. Okay, excellent. Thank you for answering so many questions for us. Um, I just want to thank everybody uh, for listening in today and thank our two speakers. I know I definitely learned something new today. Thanks everybody. Um, just wanted to also say this Thursday session on the 9th of April at the same time, we'll have three speakers who will be presenting under the theme of membrane, membrane trafficking in Parkinson's disease. So if this is a topic that interests you or you know of someone that would be interested in this, please register or spread the word for the Thursday session. Also, if anyone listening is interested in presenting at our 3P seminars, please email uh, 3pseminars at gmail.com or look for details on our Twitter or 3PT CPT website. Um, and with that, Thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.